800 years ago, Europe awoke to a terrible army which suddenly appeared out of the eastern mists. Very little was known about it. What was known was terrifying. It had already annihilated everything and everyone who dared stand in its path. These were the Mongols, the Tatars, the Devil's Horsemen. Save us, O oh Lord, from the wrath of the Tatars. The call went out for the defense of Christendom. To Germany, ardent at war, to France, who nurses an undaunted soldiery, to Spain, to England, mighty with warriors and ships, to Sicily, to Ireland, to frozen Norway. to no avail. Across Poland and Hungary, entire armies were put to the sword. It seemed nothing, not even prayer, could stop the invaders from sweeping right through Europe to the sea. The church, convinced that Armageddon was upon them all, preached that the invaders were none other than the children of Gog and Magog, the servants of Satan, sent to punish a sinful world. To others, it seemed that God himself had deserted them. This was the end of everything, of time itself. This scatter of stones on the steppes of Mongolia is all that is left of Karakorum. It was once the capital of the greatest land empire that there has ever been. For a few decades during the 13th century, this was the most important city in the world. Ambassadors and envoys were summoned here from as far afield as Kaifung, Baghdad, Moscow and Lyon to pay tribute to the great Khan. And it was from here that the Mongol rulers governed an empire that stretched for more than 5,000 miles from the Pacific to the Danube. Mongolia is today emerging from 70 years of isolation imposed by a communist regime which erased all reference to that early empire. The heroes of the past were dismissed as irrelevant and replaced by more contemporary idols. Men like Suke Bato, a contemporary of Lenin. But with Glasnost and all that has followed, Mongolians have begun to rediscover and celebrate the heroes of their distant past. The figure that stands at the heart of this renaissance is the Mongolian once and future king. Genghis Khan. His deeds have been turned into folklore and the man himself elevated to the status of a god. He is now regarded as the father of the nation, the focus of resurgent Mongolian nationalism, 
His spirit is destined, they say, to return and lead the country to another era of greatness. Yet, to the rest of the world, the name of Genghis Khan is still synonymous with the rape of civilization. But history also shows him to have been a leader of genius, and he could hardly have been that simply on a basis of terror. It's difficult to unravel the truth. Many of the early accounts of the man were written by his enemies. The first Mongolian account, the famous secret history, was written after his death, and, not surprisingly, is a mixture of fact and fantasy. It begins absolutely in the realms of myth by describing the genesis of the Mongol people near the shores of Lake Baikal in the heart of Central Asia. There was once a blue wolf whose destiny had been wrought from heaven and who took as his mate a fallow deer. Passing over the waters of the sea, they camped at the head of the Onon River, where Batassian was born, near the foot of Mount Birkin Khaldun. According to the secret history, the descendants of the Blue Wolf, Batassian and his family, were the tribe of nomadic people that became known as the Mongols. By the 12th century, the Mongols had settled in a remote plateau in Central Asia. They were one of half a dozen similar nomadic tribes whose names, the Kirids, the Merkids, the Naimans, the Onguts, and the Kitans, are long forgotten. The lives of the steppe nomads have always been governed by the need to find pasture for their flocks. The nomads are also dependent on the horse. Ever since its domestication in southern Russia between four and five thousand years ago, the steppe nomads have learnt to exploit its remarkable speed and stamina. It's not surprising then that they were not just herdsmen, but also great hunters. The summer pastures sustain vast herds, but it's the winters which have always tested both man and beast. Life is governed by the rhythm of the seasons. In the summer, when the temperature is over 100 degrees, the steppe nomads migrate with their flocks up into the cool highlands. Then in the winter, when it's 30 below zero for months at a time, they return to the sheltered valleys. The lakes and rivers remain frozen for up to six months a year. So generations of nomads have had to cut and cart great slabs of ice back to their camps for drinking water. The steppe nomads have always lived in tents, known as yurts or gurs. Made of felt stretched across a wooden frame, they can be dismantled and loaded onto ox carts in less than an hour. In this bleak environment, a life developed which is stripped of all but the bare necessities. The fuel? Dried animal dung, for there's no wood on the step. Eight hundred years ago, as today, the staple food was mutton. Almost every part of the sheep is eaten or used in one way or another. 
The Mongols made no pots, they never forged metal, they didn't even weave cloth. They never cultivated the land, nor kept pigs or chickens. They did nothing that might impede their ability to simply pack up and move on to new pastures. Life was a timeless battle with the environment and was mirrored in the struggles to defend good grazing land against their neighbors. Murder and tribal wars were commonplace. Yet, from these unpromising conditions, even harsher 800 years ago than today, there emerged the figure of Temujin, the man who would become Genghis Khan. From clues in the secret history, it is thought that Temujin was born in 1167 near Mount Burkhan Khaldun in eastern Mongolia. His father, a local chieftain, was murdered by a rival tribe and Temujin and his family were abandoned. From the age of 13, he struggled to avenge his father's death and retake his birthright. The early part of his story tells of the making of important friendships and alliances. But after a series of betrayals, his private struggle turns into a campaign for absolute supremacy. For more than 15 years, Temujin and his followers waged war against one tribe after another. After each victory, supporters would flock to his cause, only to melt away again at the next setback. 